Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. On the Logistics of Logistics, I talk to experts in logistics and transportation, warehousing, fulfillment, supply chain, and of course, technology. And during these interviews, I'm always the one asking the dumb questions. I ask the dumb questions so you don't have to. Today's topic is connecting the smart fleet ecosystem with my friend Amit Jain. Amit is the founder and chief operating officer of a company called Rhodes, a Silicon Valley-based fleet tech company. Fleet tech management technology is very fragmented, lots of silos. They're not connected. Rhodes is solving that problem and putting all the fleet tech solutions into a smart fleet ecosystem. So check out my interview with Amit. So how's it going, Amit? Great, Joe. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much for being on my show. Amit, please introduce yourself and your company and where you're calling from today. Yeah, sure. Today, I'm based in Atlanta, Georgia, even though a lot of times my company is based in Silicon Valley. So I spent a lot of time there. And my company's name is Rhodes. We started in 2018 with the idea of connecting the smart fleet ecosystem, hence the name of this podcast. And the whole thing, what we're doing is we're trying to revolutionize how fleets optimize themselves using these solutions across 50 different categories, right? So we have a three-pronged strategy. We are trying to connect the data. We are trying to connect the commerce. And we are trying to connect the user experience for the fleets out there today. So when you say fleet, how many trucks do you need before you're a fleet? Oh, the great question. So for us, we consider, even though fleets is uh, usually micro fleets is anything less than five, and then you have fleets uh, further up, but the solutions that can be leveraged on our marketplaces can also be done by owner operators. So for us, anybody who's an owner operator and up is considered to be viable to be leveraging our solutions. Yep. And so your company name is Rhodes, R-O-A-D-Z. And you you said it's telematics? No. So we are a marketplace platform. So we pre-integrate solutions across the ecosystem. So telematics solutions is one of those, I would say right now we have over 100 solutions on our platform. So that vary, they come from 40 different uh, solution categories. Telematics, like I said, is just one of them. We also have camera solutions, distracted driving solutions, predictive maintenance, TMSs, and the list goes on. We we are looking at 40 different categories of solutions that we pre-integrate and bring onto our platform. So your platform, how do I access, if if I'm a a fleet owner or a driver, how do I access the roads? Question. So we essentially white label our platform to the largest strategic players in the fleet management ecosystem. So companies like Bosch, for instance, they have leveraged our marketplace platform and they branded it Fleet Store. That's one example. So in order to access, you basically go to www.fleetstore.com and you will see uh, a marketplace with on, on the Bosch platform, we have roughly 58 solutions across 13 different categories, right? So each uh, host, we call them host because even though we host the solution in AWS, they're essentially white labeling it. So we call them generally hosts. So they can choose which solutions and which categories they want to expose. So one example, like I said, you do not go to, while we have our own website, you can go to roads roadz.com and look at what we do. But if you do want to look and consider curated solutions, you can go to fleetstore.com, which I said is a Bosch initiative. You can browse these curated solutions. You can access and buy these curated solutions. And by the way, it is a great place to for fleets of any size to go because not only you find curation, but we have cashback programs, which is pretty unique in the industry you get very competitive pricing to be able to buy these curated solutions, which by the way, have been pre-integrated in terms of data. So there's a whole another benefit to you to be able to buy and leverage these solutions from fleetstore.com. Yep. So I would think of like, when you say a marketplace, my first thought is Amazon is a marketplace. I can buy anything I want on Amazon within reason. So you guys have a marketplace. You're not, so you're selling telematics, you're selling a whole bunch of different things. 
do I get the, do, does a driver see this on his mobile phone or on his ELD system or tablet? How do they see this? Yeah, so you can access feed. It's a web browser. You go to any web browser, whether on your mobile device, tablets, phones, or a desktop. You can go to www.fleetstore.com. And on a mobile device, obviously, you have slightly different experience because of the uh, device uh, form factor. But if you want to look at the entire site, um, you go to a uh, desktop and you can access it. Look, once you go to the site, there is three or four different ways to get to a solution that can help you the most. One thing that I always recommend people is to use the smart recommender. That's a feature that we have built in, which basically asks you four simple questions. What's your fleet size? What's your fleet type, heavy duty, light duty, or a mix? What is your major problem you're trying to solve, right? Is it uh, you're trying to solve fuel? You're trying to solve driver training issues, whatever it is. The macro problem you're trying to solve and a micro problem. So four questions. Based on that, the tool will give you up to three solutions that can help address your problem, right? So sometimes people do not know what the solution is, but they know their problem for sure. So that's why I recommend people go in there, use the Smart Recommender. It'll give you those up to three solutions, and then you can look at the solutions. These are curated solutions, as I mentioned before. So you look at them and you can see they will be a good fit for you by your fleet size. So the problems that a fleet, which has a thousand vehicles, is very different from that of an owner operator, right? So the curation that we do really helps you get to the right solution so that once you start using it, you will gain the maximum benefit out of those solutions. There are other ways to get to a solution. You can actually just, if you know which category or what type of solution you're looking for, you can directly go to that category and look at the choice of solutions we have there. Or there is a search button. So you can just type in a keyword and it'll give you solutions. So those are some of the different ways that you can access these solutions on fleetstore.com. Yeah, and so you're selling on fleetstore.com Basically, you're selling technology and tools that that fleets need, and so rather than them having to go out individually and look for all these, you're saying, "Hey, we've got a curated list on our platform, and I'm assuming I can rate rate things and and, and you guys looked into each one of these solutions before you put it on your platform." Yeah, so we do not allow you to rate it on the site. What we have done is we have done that work for you. The founders of Roads come from the industry. Uh, we have over 80 man years of experience on the leadership team. So we generally, uh, in one of my previous roles, I was an analyst. And so I looked at a lot of different solutions in the industry. So did my other leadership peers, right? So we do that job for you. We do the job of pre-selecting only the best in breed solutions. Those are the only ones which are exposed to you. And hence, you do not need to worry about the rating. We have solved that problem behind the right. scenes for and, you. And yeah, if you have problems with them, you'll kick them off and get their replacement. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. So, if issues, we certainly intervene. Yeah, and it's an interesting thing because I actually have written up on my on my desk here. It says curated because I always forget that name, but it reminds me. I like to shop at Target every once in a while, their grocery store, and I feel like it's curated. There's a very small amount of SKUs there, and somebody could say, "I want more choices." Mm, th they seem to be the right choices for me. So when I go there. They don't have as many aisles as you would see at Walmart or Meyer or some other grocery stores, but it seems right for me. So I can go, yeah, I would call that curated and people seem to really curate it because we have tons of options these days and having somebody do the legwork to find the stuff that I want is useful. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, let me just reinforce that. So over the course of my last 20 years, I have probably spoken to thousands of drivers and fleets, right, in my different roles. And one of the challenges that all of these guys are, have is they're so busy. Okay. Fleet managers, literally, if I'm on an interview with them, they have to take a break five times because somebody's calling them, somebody's texting them, right? So time is an issue, right? They need to get to the right answer very quickly. Today, there are literally thousands of solutions across 50 different categories that these people have access to. Yeah, there's one easy way. You can go to Google, 
type in the problem, guess what? You get 5.5 million hits. You never go past second or third page, but that's the problem. Uh, discoverability, you, you can discover the solutions on Google, but is that a good fit for your precise business need, for your fleet size, for your fleet type? The answer is no. You will see the first page, second page. You'll call these people. You'll get the solution. Guess what? Two months in, you'll realize it's not a good fit. You're not going to use it. And now you are uh, look, locked into a three-year contract. What do you do? You have to pay the early termination fees, right? We are trying to solve that problem for you. By curation, we get you to the right solution based on your fleet size, your fleet type, and your business need. Hence, your chances of optimization and realization of benefits is exponentially higher. Yep. Yep. So let's switch gears for a minute. Tell us a little bit about you, Amit. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? Give us some brief career highlights. You got a long career. Give us some brief career highlights before you started Rhodes. And I say Rhodes, but we're talking a little bit more about Fleet Store, which Rhodes is the underlying technology platform for Fleet Store. Yeah, cor correct. So I got involved with Rhodes and Fleet Store since 2019. But before that, like I said, 20 plus years, I actually grew up in India. I came to the U.S. Where, from my where, where were you in India? New Delhi. I grew up in New Delhi, so capital of the country. So I came here when I was very young, 17, to uh, do my undergrad, which at that time in the early 90s was pretty unique. So I was able to really benefit a lot. Where'd you go to school? Growing up. I, I went to undergrad. I did at Grove City College, which is based. Uh, it's a liberal arts school right outside of Pittsburgh. They have a motto, the best kept secret in American education. And there's a reason for that. The, the really talented group of faculty and administration. And I had an immense, ex immensely great experience over there. So some, if somebody is looking for their kids, check out Grove City College, great school. I will say this. I just talked to, just talked to the professors from MIT, Yossi Sheffi. And one of the things I'm, I'm against this whole brand name thing we're doing with the colleges. And it drives me crazy because I went to University of Michigan, which I love their football team. Uh, the education's fine, but I went to a lot of colleges that no one knows about. Cleary College, I went to Cleary University now. Went to Northwood. Those are small schools where I got much more attention. And the memorable experiences I had there in my education, my memorable experiences were at small schools. And somewhere along the line, if it wasn't uh, an Ivy League or a team that had uh, – a great football team or a basketball team, it was like, who cares? It's not a real school. And that's the wrong thinking. You're so right. And for me to choose Grove City, a couple of reasons. I did pretty well academically in India and on my SATs. So I actually got into a couple of the Ivy Leagues. But coming from India, I needed to be funded. And Grove City gave me the opportunity and the full scholarship. So that was the impetus. But let me tell you, that small school thing you're describing is so apropos because I got so involved in activities. I was elected into the student government as a vice president. Imagine a kid, a foreign kid with a thick accent coming from India, getting nominated, elected to the student government. That was something else. I don't think that would have happened in a big school besides got a scholarship. So that was pretty neat. But yeah, I completely agree with you. People need to consider places where they can flourish. In a big school, you're a number. Yeah, we, we, we need to take the brand names off of college where you, some... So Again, I did it myself. I wanted to, I went to these little schools and I went to University of Michigan because I wanted that prestige. And now I look back and, and again, I, I cheer for the football team more than I do anything. <laughs> right. And I would never. Not so much Ohio State, I would imagine. No. <laughs> Although I have a lot of Buckeyes on my podcast. I like, we, we have to get along off the football field. Yeah. A lot of logistics goes through Ohio. You better get along with those people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so before we get off of India, besides family and food, what do you miss most about India? Oh boy, the diversity. You go 100 miles in India, you find not only different food, but a totally new language, okay? <laughs> a totally different landscape, totally different attire that people wear. It is amazing the diversity that you find in India. You don't think of that, that. That would have never come to mind. I was like, yeah, you got 1.3 billion Indians, <laughs> but they're not all the same, right? Is that what you're telling me? Exactly. So yeah, that's what is interesting and I miss. Architecture, 
varies dramatically as you go every 200, 250 miles. Yeah, yeah. So what do you like live about living here in the United States? Oh, everything. I've been now, I have lived now twice as long in the US than I did in India. So for me, America is home and the people, the diversity here is amazing as well. The landscapes, oh, the innovation, the culture of innovation, the culture of capitalism, it is just probably unique in the, in the, in the world. I don't know of any other place which has this amount of diversity and inclusion and uh, innovation. It is just all oh, awestruck. Oh, I'm awestruck. Yeah. I, I told you the nice, nice silly story about when I was a kid, my dad bought a friend home from Ford Motor Company, was an engineer, and he was from India. His name was Singh. And I always remember he was a Sikh, so he had the turban. Boy, oh boy, me and my friends were there and we were like, we looked at him like he was from Mars. He was very nice to us. <laughs> but I saw him many years later. I almost felt like I should apologize, but he was such a great guy. But it's funny, now you can't walk through, you can't go anywhere in technology in the United States without seeing lots of Indians. By the way, when I worked at Chrysler, they have in the cafeteria, Indian, the Indian food line. And then I, so I would get it. I would always get that like at least once a week, the cafeteria there. And then I would always say to my Indian friends, how do you eat this every day? I can't, it's too spicy. <laughs> <laughs> they go, and they goes, we don't eat that like that every day. Anyway, love Indian yeah. food. So let's get back to, to it. Why, when and why did you guys start Rhodes? What did you see? that you thought, hey, this is a big hole in the market that we haven't, that we're not seeing filled adequately. Yeah. Do you want to go, uh, me to go into your background? Because that will dovetail very nicely into why we started this. As you were asking me, my background. So after college, um, I joined Liberty Mutual as a commercial lines underwriter. And it'll become clear how it came full circle. But after that, pretty much for 20 years, I worked as an analyst at a company called Aberdeen Group, where I led the IoT research. I was a product leader at GE, where we built a telematics product and took it from concept to commercialization. And then for uh, over six years at Verizon, first I was in charge of Verizon's IoT strategy, vertical strategy. So me and my team looked at all kinds of IoT verticals from say, transportation. Say, by the way, when he says IoT, it means Internet of Things. That's all these sensors that, is right. that we have. Yes, I, Internet of Things. Sometimes they so, say Internet of Trucking, but it is Internet of Things. <laughs> Internet of things, exactly. And there's so many sub-verticals. There is a transportation, clearly, or fleet management. There's asset management. There is uh, retail. There is healthcare. There is smart cities. Within smart cities, you have so many different Smart, smart roads, you have smart parking, smart traffic lights, and all those kinds. So we looked at a lot of them. And then my strategy called for taking Verizon Upstack into platforms and solutions because they already were providing the data to companies like OnStar, right? But that was it. And once I, me and my team did the analysis, we realized this was back in 2011, right? We said within 10 years, if Verizon just focused on the data pipe, they would become a myoscopic part of the value chain, of the IoT value chain, less than 5%. So do you want to play in less than 5% or 95%? So we were able to convince the Verizon leadership and board to invest. And so I was tasked with acquiring companies in the area of fleet management first. And so went and acquired a company called, at that time, Hughes Telematics, which had uh, telematics solutions both for consumers as well as for uh, fleets. And then later on, I joined Verizon uh, at that time called Verizon Telematics, and I was in charge of strategy, M&A, business development, and product innovation. So there I acquired two other companies, Fleetmatix and Telegis, creating what's today called Verizon Connect. So that was I was a chief architect of that and then stayed on with the company, but uh, at one point realized that once you merge these big behemoths, you have to concentrate on assimilating them. So at that point, I decided to leave Verizon and get into the startup world. So Rhodes is actually my second startup. And the reason uh, I got together with some of the industry veterans to start Rhodes was we saw there were some inherent challenges that fleets were facing in order to optimize themselves. One, they were fleets, again, majority of 90% of the fleets are 20 trucks or fewer. For them, 
curation, uh, sorry, discoverability of a solution, they don't have that much money to invest in innovation. So in the limited amount, they need to make sure they're investing in the right areas, right? So that's a challenge for them. For mid to large fleets, the challenge is slightly different. It's not as much discoverability. They, they can find the right solution generally because a lot of fleet solution providers are calling on them all the time, or they're part of some good associations, or they subscribe to the right trade publications. So they generally get that. But what they lack is their, their problem is slightly different. Their problem is they are actually using a lot of the solutions, but the data from these solutions is siloed. So they literally have to collate the data externally, manually, in order to drive decisions, or most of them are driving decisions based on very myoscopic data. For instance, I'll, I'll use an example. Actually, I'll come to that. So, so we looked at this problem and said, okay, there mid to large fleets have a certain set of challenge. Small fleets have a set of certain set, set of challenge. So why don't we become the connective tissue and address this challenge, which is where we came up and we said, let's create a company where we become the connective tissue and connect the data, connect the commerce, and connect the user experience. Once we do that, we can solve the problems for all kinds of owner operators to micro fleets, to small fleets, to midsize and large fleets, right? So that's the challenge we said, Let's go and solve this challenge for the different um, segments of the fleet management and help them optimize them. Why? Because especially with COVID and all the supply chain issues that happen, there is a dire need for the fleet management ecosystem, which, by the way, without the optimization of that, our supply chain will not function well. And that is the sort of the nuts and bolts of the economy, right? We are, we are a consumer economy. We consume things. The goods and services, yes, they both form an important part. But without getting the right goods at the right time at the right place, you cannot really have a thriving economy. So the underlying modes of transportation that enable that to optimize that is absolutely mission critical. Yeah. I want to take a quick time out to tell you, you can now listen to the logistics of logistics on Wreaths Across America Radio. I'll put a link in the show notes. Wreaths Across America provides informational, inspiring content about members of the U.S. Armed Forces, their families, and military veterans. Their mission is to remember, honor, and teach. Wreaths Across America succeeds because of the generous support of the trucking community. Take a listen and please consider volunteering. Getting back to it, most of us, most of the people listening to my podcast, I suspect, I've never driven a truck. They know that there's trucks and they know they're expensive. They know they have a whole bunch of cool technology. But you guys created a, a platform or a marketplace that sells all these things to these fleets. So just give me a give me a handful of the things that you would sell in say the fleetstore.com environment. What are some of the things yeah, fleets, sure. fleets need to buy? Because I'm my first thought is okay, you have a truck, you need gas, you need a driver. I know we have an ELD somewhere. I'm not exactly sure how that works, but I know we have certain things. I probably have some maintenance software, but I don't understand beyond that. Yeah, no, great question. Look, at the very basic level, every fleet is trying to do four things. They're trying to do vehicle management, driver management, operations or work management, and compliance management. Right, depending on what type of fleet you have, you may have a different mix of these four. But essentially, it comes down to these four areas. Excuse me, that fleets are or owner operators are trying to manage. So we actually have solutions that cater to or address all of these four areas. And say that we'll say those one more time for us: vehicle management, yep. driver management, yep. operations or work management, and compliance management. Yeah, I guess that cover that's a lot more than you think about though. That's a lot when you now that you say it, I was like, oh, that got very big very quick, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. These four things generally encapsulate, there may be things outside of this, but they encapsulate most of the stuff that a fleet needs to do. So when you look at solutions, like I said, we address most of the solutions. So in vehicle management, if you will. We have uh, telematic solutions, for instance, or GPS tracking solutions. We have asset tracking solutions. We have uh, maintenance management solutions. We have roadside assistance solutions, if you will. 
So those are some examples of types, types of solutions we offer through Fleet Store, which is a Bosch initiative. Then for driver management, we have camera solutions. We have distracted driving solutions. We have driver training solutions. So the challenge there, driver shortage, driver retention is probably, other than the owner operators, probably the biggest need. And I, I look at studies even now on a regular basis. So, so when you look at studies published by any publication house or analyst firm, driver shortage, driver, driver retention as a top problem for all fleets, right? So you need to, in order to help solve that problem, you need to first recognize what are the areas of improvement, right? So the first set of technologies gets you to understand where the challenges are with each individual driver, right? So you have to be driver specific. And then you have to have the right training and incentive incentives to motivate the driver to, to get better at what they do, right? So we have driver training solutions. In terms of operations and work management, we have a mobile workforce management solutions, work order solution, work order management solutions, mobile form solutions, things of that nature, right? And then from compliance, clearly, as for the heavy trucks, there is the DOT mandate or FMCSA mandate. They need to have hours of service compliance, IFTA compliance, uh, DVIR compliance. So we have solutions that go to solve most of those ELD. You mentioned ELD a few times. So that helps with the uh, with the hours of service uh, compliance, if you will. So we have a lot of those solutions also. So those are uh, some sampling of some of the solutions that we offer across these four different categories. And, and you said earlier that one of the, you try and do three things, com- connecting the data, connecting the commerce, connecting the experience. If I bought a whole bunch of these tools, technologies, the challenge I have is I'm looking at, again, <laughs> consistent theme here, siloed information. So I might be a fleet manager and I go, oh, I'm looking at the distracted driver information. Oh, interesting. And I go over the cameras. I'm looking at camera stuff. I don't get the, I, I can never get a cohesive picture because my data is all in a different silo. And that's a problem. That's a problem all in every business, it seems like. It, it always reminds me, when I first time I saw TMS, I thought, oh my God, that's brilliant. It, it's all the answers. This is it. It does everything. I'm sure I said it. It does everything. <laughs> <laughs> and I know I had customers who believed it does everything, but all it did is raise the bar. <laughs> and then people started saying, yeah, that's nice. I got a TMS, but I also need dynamic pricing. Could you connect this to it? Oh, I also need a weather app. I need So anyway, getting back to it, you guys within your system, if I buy all within your marketplace, I get all this data connected so I can. So is that part of what Rhodes does? Part of what Fleet Store does? Yeah, absolutely. So you hit the nail on the head. This issue is not only there because people are using different solutions like GPS tracking, camera, TMS, all that. Even within the same solution, especially for larger fleets, you think about, um, we we deal with fleets all the time. Same fleet may use multiple telematic solutions. So they may use Verizon Connect. They may use Samsara. They may use Lytx. They may use Geotab, so on and so forth. And the data resolution and the reporting from all of these uh, different systems, they're not going to talk to each other. Why? <laughs> they're co- competitors. So you need a neutral third party like us, a Switzerland, if you will, that is doing the integration of all these systems. It's a big problem for a lot of the larger fleets, right? They're using through acquisitions as they go over time. They get all these disparate solutions in the same category, if you will. Add to that the complexity with the EVs and the ICE vehicles, right? EVs are reporting different kind of data. Ice, ice vehicles are reporting different kind of data. Somebody needs to normalize it and contextualize it. Again, somebody like Rhodes. Our benefit is those are the challenges we founded ourselves to solve, right? Connecting the data. We pre-integrate with most of the solutions that we onboard onto our system. Hence, as you said, if somebody buys a solution from our ecosystem, from one of our marketplaces. By the way, Bosch Fleet Store is one of them, but we have others as well. So you have, you're have you the beneficiary of getting pre-integrated data so you can then see all the information, all the KPIs coming from all these disparate systems in a single 
pane of glass. You don't have to go to different systems and assimilate and aggregate data manually. It's all available for you. All the combined and the holistic data, not only from the different solutions in one category, but from multiple categories, you can see in what we call a unified fleet workspace or unified dashboards. And that is a huge benefit besides the fact that you're already getting curation and you're getting very competitive pricing because we negotiate wholesale-based pricing with all of the partners who who come on our platform. Furthermore, one of the things that we recently launched that everybody will benefit from, and it's almost unique in the industry, is we are offering cash back uh, for many of the solutions on on fleetstore.com. So one should really come, they'll not only benefit from selecting the right solution, which is a good fit based on their fleet size and fleet type. They're getting a very competitive pricing. They're getting the, the cash back on most of the solutions. And last but not the least, they can then look at pre-integrated data and make holistic decisions rather than looking at siloed data. Yeah, it's interesting when when you're talking about this, I my first thought of, when I think about curated connected is what Apple's done with their phone, right? You you only get Apple apps on that. And you also know that anything they launch is going to work very well in their environment or they wouldn't bring it on. And yes. I'm an Android guy because I'm not cool enough to have an Apple phone, but I'm not so sure it's the same thought process with Android versus Apple. I think with Apple, when they launch something, they say, no, this is has to be designed with us in mind first and foremost. It can't be, we can't be an afterthought in it because of the nature of the of our product. Interesting. Let me say something there because that's a very important point you have raised. Not every company can do what we do. We were based out of Silicon Valley. We had an AP, API first company. So the way we built this system was with that issue in mind, because look, we have to deal with solutions that some of them are legacy solutions. They have evolved over a course of time, right? So we have to deal with all different stages, uh, technologies which are in all different stages. So we are uniquely positioned because we grew up like that. We grew up as an API first company, a Silicon Valley company. And what you said there is so important because not everybody can do. People, we are a flexible Apple and we can take in from any kind of data coming from any kind of system, right? And we actually also advise companies on how to develop uh, really robust APIs. So, so that's an important part of it because without that data assimilation, you're really not driving optimal decisions in your business. Yep. So when you say that you're an API first company, I, I understand APIs vaguely. <laughs> and when I think of you, so you guys created roads and then it's, you sell this white label to companies like Bosch. Now, when you say fleet store, is fleet store online or is that, would a driver or a, a fleet access that on their tablet in their truck? How, is, how are they interacting with fleet store? Yeah, no, absolutely. They can go to www.fleetstore.com from any browser whether they're on their desktop or their tablet or their mobile phone, they can access it from any of those different form factors. And as I was explaining before, there are all these cool ways to get to a solution. Either you can use a smart recommender, as I described earlier, or you can just plug in a keyword in a search bar, or you can go to the categories if you know what you're looking for and, and look for a solution that way. Bosch, what's why, why is Bosch in this business then? Great question. So... Look, Bosch decided, I would say about a year and a half ago, that historically, they are one of the best and the biggest OEM tier one suppliers, right? So they, they're a global company. Uh, their name is, is synonymous with quality, right? So they made a really good name for themselves in the automotive industry as a supplier. However, they realized that they need to diversify and start selling solutions directly to fleets because... One of the things, having talked to their leadership, we realized they actually were one of the inventors of the CAN bus and the CAN messages, right? So if anybody knows the guts of a vehicle, it is Bosch. With predictive maintenance and maintenance being such a big part of a company, a dead truck is no good to anybody. You need to you need to minimize the downtime on a truck, right? So that's all related to not only preventative maintenance, but predictive maintenance. So Bosch, because of their knowledge of the guts of a vehicle, the guts of a powertrain, are so well suited to develop innovative solutions when it comes to maintenance. So they 
dedicated a part of the company to pursue that. And their scientists are developing all these cool solutions. But the OEMs may or may not be the right consumer of that technology, right? So they said, let's go sell directly to fleets. How do you build a fleet um, clientele? This was the way they said, let's align with roads, launch a marketplace with third-party solutions initially, which is what they did in January of this year. And then slowly they're adding their innovation to their marketplace as well. So they introduced their first solution uh, not too long ago uh, called Smart Trailer. Uh, there's another one in the world, Smart Track and Trace. And then they'll, they have another couple of dozen that their oh, scientists yeah. and teams are working on. So that's what their, their reason was to get into the market and start making that connection and learning from fleets by exposing them to these, initially these third-party solutions and then their own. Yeah, I've worked with Bosch quite a bit because I'm an automotive guy originally, and Bosch is a top company. You can't go anywhere without them. It's interesting to me when you start connecting systems like you do and taking the data. I'll use one example that I think about lately. We have a real shortage of drivers. We all know that. We also have a problem with a real shortage of diesel mechanics right now. And if I have to service my vehicle, I want to know ahead of time so I can plan it. So I don't end up with a day where I say, hey, I took, I, I had a problem. I had my truck towed to a location and it's going to sit for a day or two before they even get to the diagnostics. That's a real problem. I'm better off to say, hey, the, my systems are telling me that I have a problem. Also, my ELD is telling me uh, that this driver is running out of hours. Let's let's connect with let's get that let's get that maintenance done at the right time for the driver at the right time for the truck before it's sitting on the side of the road where endangering the driver and endangering other people too and that's just one example i imagine there's just dozens and dozens of insights we can gain when we put all of the data together and that this is one of the biggest challenges we have is we have data we just don't have knowledge and insights that let make help us make our business better. I don't want more data. I want insights that say, Joe, do this right now. <laughs> exactly. No, that's spot on. And I'll, I'll add a few more examples that people probably struggle with all the time. Look, one of the key ways to reduce fuel spend is by minimizing your miles driven, because that directly goes towards your fuel consumption and ultimately your fuel cost. So a best in fl class fleet, what do they do? They usually take their miles driven and they look at their planned routes and they optimize them continuously all the time. But the plan sits in their scheduling application. The actual miles comes from their telematic solution. So the data is sitting in silos. Unless you make them match them and do that continuous optimization, nothing will work. So best in class company, that's what they do. They, they combine the data, they look at actual versus plan driven miles all the time. And they realize sometimes the drivers, they go on a detour and are playing golf, right? And hence it adds to the miles driven, which is affecting their fuel consumption and fuel costs, right? So that's what a best in class fleet does. They mesh the data from plan and the actual, they continuously monitor it and they continuously optimize it. Another example, that best-in-class fleets do is you can look at some information on driver safety through a camera solution, right? There's another set of uh, safety you can derive from a distracted driving solution that tells you if the driver is using a mobile device while the vehicle is in motion. Yet another way for you to understand a driver behavior is through telematics. They give you harsh driving, harsh braking, harsh cornering, harsh acceleration, those kind of events, right? Now, each in itself will provide you some insight into the driver behavior. However, the best-in-class fleets combine the behavior from all these sources and then develop the driver safety quotient based on the combined data, not individual data. Because guess what? At the end of the day, you want to improve the driver safety. And how you do it is by incentivizing them through gamification and better driver training. Won't it be cool to look at what training a driver needs exactly based on their problems rather than just genetically giving them a set of training modules to go through. That's what best-in-class fleets do, and hence the data integration is so important. 
But before we hit record, we were talking about the driver shortage. And well, this is just a crazy difficult job. And I told you when I was young, if you were a driver, first off, the population was half. So we had this wide open country and a driver would drive and no one knew where he was. And he was like a modern day cowboy. He was a pioneer, right? Now we're bringing all this technology and a lot of it is saying, okay, we're going to see if we can't manage this guy better. Anybody who's been managed knows what that feels like. And all of a sudden we have, we also have a driver shortage and I don't think it's going to get a lot better until we make this job better. It has to pay more. That's my perspective. It has to pay more. This used to be the number one paying blue collar job. My mother's family did a lot of trucking. They were from Pennsylvania. And that's how they discovered this city way over here, five hours away in Detroit. <laughs> and we, they moved because there was a lot of opportunity here. But I guess working in coal mines isn't as nice as working in factories. Fortunately, I don't, <laughs> fortunately, I don't know about either. But getting back to it, we have to make this job better. And I think technology is going to be one of the ways, and I know some people are probably listening going, you're making the driver's life worse because you're your big brother. But I think we have the opportunity to make it safer, but also more livable because we have to figure something out on this. No, that's so such an important point. I think you. I was telling you in my past life, both at GE and Verizon, one of the things I always did, I met thousands of fleets over time as clients or potential clients. And I always said, guys, it's great to meet you folks in the back office, but I want to meet the drivers and understand what their challenges are, what their problems are. There was a recent study published by Atri on the challenges faced by the truck, the drivers and the fleets. And you know what? There were differences in the top 10. Of course. And, and the sequence <laughs> of them, right? But you would, be, you would be surprised to know, or maybe not surprised to know, that driver compensation was not the number one thing listed no. by the drivers. Don't know that. So, so compensation is a big part of it, but it's not the only part that motivates them. The number one thing that was a problem for the drivers was parking, was parking, right? And that is so easily solved by some of the technology solutions that we have, because we have not only with the plethora, we have access to not only where the parking spot spaces are, but in many cases, whether the space is open or not, if you have an EV truck, then whether or not it has EV capability, charging capability or not, right? So we can give some of these tools in the hand of the drivers and solve the number one problem they listed, which was not driver compensation. How amazing is that, right? That technology can solve that problem. But it takes time to understand, to talk to them, to understand. It's not always comp compensation was number three on that list, by the way. So it is important, but there were other challenges that they listed even up above. Yeah, I want to take a quick time out to tell you about my friends over at Green Screens. That's greenscreens.ai. Green Screens is a dynamic pricing technology for the truckload spot market that delivers buy and sell side market intelligence to help brokers and 3PLs grow and protect their margins. Freight brokers and 3PLs using Green Screens gain the following advantages. Faster pricing for both buy side and sell side transactions. Pricing that is more accurate and more likely to win profitable business. Guys, dynamic pricing is the next killer app. Hundreds of freight brokers are already using it because it enables them to develop faster, more accurate quotes. This is the time. Check out Green Screens in the show notes, greenscreens.ai. So getting back to it, I talked to Ashley Thomas. She's a driver recruiter the other day, a few weeks ago. She got a crazy story, but she's very good at what she does. And she said, a lot of it comes down to respect. She said, a lot of drivers will say to her, uh, and this is anecdotal, it's not a study, but she said, a lot of them feel like they're disrespected. A lot feel like the equipment isn't ex as expected. She said, also, they want to get home at night. And again, I think if they do have to spend the night on the road, I want to know somewhere safe. One of the reasons I think we don't have women in this space is they want to be home every night, Yep, more, more likely. But also, if they do have to sleep on the road, make it safe. I know that safety is a big concern. Absolutely. I, I think to myself is uh, when I get on the road, go to a hotel, I don't sleep well the first night. That is part of the human uh, brain, right? We don't sleep well in a place that's brand new. If there's... Uh, 
sketchy behavior going on where I parked, uh, I'm not going to sleep well. <laughs> yes. And yes. And I could also see where you go. I'll just take a Excedrin PM or whatever you take to sleep. And then you're dro- yeah. groggy the next day. And I'm driving this yeah. huge tank around. So we have to do a better job of making these drivers. But I do think technology is one of those solutions. It, it is not part of the problem, although I guarantee there's some drivers saying, I don't want Big Brother looking. That's a reality we all have to live with is that we're going to have to monitor these. These are assets that are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars and the lives involved are worth more than that. But you hit the nail on the head. It's all about communicating. When we talk to, you're right. First instinct that some of the drivers have is, oh, it's Big Brother. But once you now start talking of the safety element of how these solutions can help them, how they can help them get home faster, right? So they can spend that night at home rather than a hotel. That's when they start buying into it. And most solution providers do not do it effectively. Most fleet managers, by the way, I'm sorry to say, do not do that effectively. So once you start solving the problem and listen to them and then talk about how technology is going to help them solve their problems, they all buy into it. And so we need to coach our fleet managers and our solution providers better on how to approach the drivers with this value prop. So in the beginning, we talked about what you guys are trying to do is connecting the data, connecting the commerce and connecting about the experience. Why don't you wrap it up by talking about how Rhodes and your white label stores like Fleet Store do that? Yeah, no, thank you so much. Look, at the end of the day, the challenges that we extensively discussed earlier need to resolve for fleets to optimize themselves. Best-in-class fleets are already doing this kind of stuff. Innovation um, is definitely permeating the fleet industry in in a large way. Um, It is right now in terms of technology adoption, depending on the type of technology, is uh, more focused on best-in-class fleets, but that's why there's a huge opportunity for other fleets to catch up and, and optimize themselves. And at the end of the day, improve not only their operations, improve their safety. Nuclear verdicts is a big problem that is in the existing industry and gives sleepless nights to fleet managers, safety managers, and to owner operators. And they raise the cost for everybody. Exactly, right? So innovation and technology really can help these companies realize the same benefits that best-in-class companies are doing. Rhodes is working behind the scenes to help bring it easily uh, to their fingertips, right? Through the, by leveraging one of our marketplaces, either fleetstore.com, which is the Bosch initiative, or we have one for a division of progressive insurance, which is live, or one which is uh, for a division uh, for GPS track it, which is one of mid-tier uh, telematics service providers. And then we are in the process of uh, launching for one of the largest insurance brokers in North America, We haven't launched yet, so that's why I'm reserving the name. But you can go access them. And the advantage is behind the scenes, we have done through our data platform, we have done the data integration. So we are normalizing and contextualizing the data, no matter what challenge or what solution that you're going to be using. We obviously are curating these solutions. We are offering cash back on many of these solutions, which is almost unheard of in the industry. And last but not least, we actually are going to be launching our MVP of the user experience or the single pane of glass. I mentioned this earlier, Unified Fleet Workspace. So these are dashboards that compile data and show and visualize it in a single pane of glass from different solutions, either in the same category or from multiple categories, right? So all that allows you to just, you know, buy these curated and discounted solutions and then use them effectively to optimize your fleets and to really drive optimal business decisions because you can't do that uh, unless you are viewing holistic data coming from all these different angles, okay? Now, add to that, we are solving the problem for mixture of EVs and ICE vehicles because the data, again, is in silos and somebody, a fleet manager who has a mixed fleet needs to look at that, not only mixed fleet because of different OEMs and different truck sizes, but EV and ICE is becoming more common. Yeah. When you say EV and ICE, that's one is electric vehicles, the other is internal combustion engine, ICE is that. That is correct. That is correct. So, and last but not least, we are using AI 
to drive a lot of optimization in these solutions and these analytics, which is really helping predictive maintenance, fuel consumption and fuel fraud detection and inventory optimization. So people really ought to consider it leveraging our marketplaces. Yep. So who's your sweet spot? Yeah, look, everybody can take advantage of it. Like I said, from owner operators to mid to large fleets, I would say depends on the solution. So the mid to large fleets can really benefit from our data integration and our unified workspace that we're going to be launching soon. The smaller fleets, the owner operators and the smaller fleets can benefit from the commerce angle because by themselves, they don't have the wherewithal to pursue volume discounts or to force volume discounts, right? Because we have pre-negotiated pricing, they can take advantage of these discounts and cash back, which will not be available. And the curation really helps the owner operators and the small fleets. So all of them can benefit, but different aspects of what we provide will benefit different fleet sizes. Now, I know we talked about fleet store and roads. So when you say these companies can all benefit from those, the things you just described there, is that this is obviously through the white market label, labeled stuff like fleetstore.com, but is it also, can I also get this through roads.com? No, so we right now do not have our own marketplace. Okay. We basically are white labeling through others. I like it. Um, we are thinking about it in the future. I like it. And I think that white label makes a lot of sense though, because you start to create kind of a standardization in the industry. And I, I, I have a web partner when I was doing digital marketing in the past. And they said, well, we're white label. We did, And what basically they were doing is that we work with marketing agencies. We don't work directly with too many small companies. And I was like, oh, I get that. And we see that more and more. It's just more specialization, which we all know seems to work. The other thing that is why it's important, Joe, nobody, Rhodes started in 2018. Nobody knows Rhodes, right? But people know and trust Bosch. People know and trust progressive insurance, right? So that was the other reason why we took this tactic. Let people, usually people will not buy from a company they don't trust, right? So by putting them up front and center, we are adding that credibility uh, and trust, which then these fleets can leverage, right? I think also as you continue to grow, you have that white label data. And at some point, you got to make it anonymous, of course, but Everybody benefits when you say, hey, we have it so selling through all these white labels and through our own firm. And the anonymous data tells us blank. And it's, that's information that you could probably provide to all of those white label companies. And that data just makes it easier and easier to make good decisions, which is what we're all trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'll do is I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile. I'll also put a link to your website. Any other links you want to give me? And your marketing team give me. So what conferences will we see you at? So we were just at NAFA not too long ago. That was a good conference for us. We are looking at towards the end of the year, there's other conferences around innovation. So there's one in Silicon Valley that we're going to be there. And we're also looking at ATA, some of the large uh, associations, whether it's NAFA, ATA, we usually attend some of those conferences. I'm assuming you're a manifest kind of company. Yes. <laughs> I'll see it manifest. I'll see it manifest. I went to manifest this last year. I loved it. And I've had Courtney and Pam on and a lot of the, a lot of their speakers come on and I moderated the shipper panel there last year. And I also huh? interviewed okay. some people love that conference. That's next year in Vegas. Same week as the Super Bowl is in Vegas, but I think that's earlier in the week, but I'll see you there. Um, maybe we can uh, go scalp some cheap tickets to the Super Bowl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you gave me an idea. I'm buying them now and I'll be scalping them. <laughs> the <Super Bowl. laughs> exactly. Anyway, um, I like to interview smart, interesting people like you, Amit. We're killing it in the space. Who else should I interview? Yeah, there's a couple of innovative companies that come to my mind. Uh, one is a fuel card company by the name of A to B. I think there's a gentleman. A with the number two B or is it A? No, actually B? A and the letters T O yep. and then B. Okay. So a they're one B. of the fastest growing uh, fuel card companies uh, in North America. A uh, gentleman by the name of Jeremiah Cook there would be a great uh, person to talk to. Other company is Carrier's Edge, which is a really uh, fast growing driver training company. Oh. And uh, gentleman Mark Murrell would be somebody you may want to interview. Wait, Mark Morell? I like it. I like it. I've not talked to either one of those companies. And yeah, you're one of those companies that I've 
it makes sense. Everything you said makes sense, but I never thought there's a company doing this. And I will throw one other thing. When I was managing freight still, what used to drive me crazy is I had customers and we'd do all of their business. And then every once in a while, we'd have a quarterly business review and they'd say, oh, Joe, FY, we did two flatbeds without you guys. This other company did it. Should I just give you those bills so you can incorporate it in your data? And I was like, <laughs> and I would say to them, why? They're like, because we just need a flatbed. I was like, we could have gotten that flatbed for you. And then it would screw up my data. And I would say, I, I, and I said this literally to someone, we would do that for free rather than have our data screwed up like it is now. I hate, and I feel this way about stuff is it makes sense. You So once I'm buying within this ecosystem, it makes sense to stay within it. And somebody says, I don't know, do they have the very best? What's well, curated? You have to trust them. But at some point that trust there's some real benefit to that trust because you saved money on it. But on top of that, all my data is now in there. Now, if I decide, oh no, I really want to go get this old system from somewhere else, another system from somewhere else. Now that's outside of my data. I And I think most of us are beginning to hate anything that's not integrated into our systems. It's just Absolutely. very foreign now. <laughs> exactly. And those who don't, will be left behind. And as they bid for jobs, they will uh, struggle with it. Not to be pedantic, but uh, it's almost uh, a requirement now. You you cannot function without it. We have integrated data. We have what I'll call business intelligence. Maybe it's a fancy word, but that business intelligence quickly becomes insights using AI and machine learning. And we're seeing that more and more. But if the data is not there, then it can't be used. That's just... Yep. Yep. You cannot manage, one thing I always used to tell my teams, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. So first you need the data, then you can manage it more effectively. So it's a whole part of the vicious circle that you need to work together. Yep. Ahmed, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and I love what you guys are doing. I think it's something I didn't consider until we talked and I was like, oh yeah, this makes sense. I get why it's happening and uh, congrats on your success. Thank you so kindly. And uh, thank you for inviting Joe. Really pleasure talking to you. Yep. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. You have been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage with leaders in the logistics and supply chain community. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, hit the like button, and leave us a nice review on Apple or Spotify or wherever else you listen. Also, please check out our videos on YouTube and connect with us on LinkedIn. We're very big on LinkedIn. And you can also reach us on the logisticsoflogistics.com, our website.